So, so uh, Graham, uh, as I told you, we should start in Hebrew. Shalom lekulam. אנחנו שמחים שהגעתם למפגש, זה מפגש חמישי, נדמה לי, שאנחנו עורכים בחודשים האחרונים. אני רוצה לספר לכם על המסגרת בעצם שבה המפגש הזה נערך. אנחנו קבוצה של אנשים, כרגע, לא כרגע, אנחנו בחסות של מרכז השל לקיימות. מקדמים הקמה של אספת אזרחים בישראל. אספת אזרחים זו טכניקה מאוד מתקדמת של שיתוף של אזרחים בעיצוב מדיניות וקבלת החלטות. היא לא חדשה מהחמש עשרה שנים האחרונות, אך לאחרונה נערך בה שימוש רב בעיקר בנושאי אקלים ולא רק. במפגשים קודמים סיפרנו על, על אספות האזרחים באירלנד, בצרפת, בדנמרק, גרמניה וכן הלאה. ואנחנו קבוצה שהמטרה שלה היא לקיים אספת אזרחים כזו בישראל, במתכונת כזו או אחרת. כצעד ראשון לכך אנחנו עשינו כמה פעולות, אנחנו למדנו את הסוגיה, חקרנו אותה, שוחחנו עם הרבה מאוד מומחים, הקשר עם מומחים בעצם אפשר לנו לעשות את סדרת הוובינארים האלה כדי לשתף בלמידה שאנחנו עושים בעצם בתחום הזה ולאחרונה גם יצאנו בקול קורא לרשויות מקומיות על מנת לקיים אספת אזרחים ראשונה בישראל ברמה של רשות מקומית כצעד ראשון בעצם לפני ביצוע של אספה ארצית, כך אנחנו מקווים. אז במפגשים קודמים, המפגשים הקודמים התאפיינו הייתי אומר בשיח על בעיקר פרקטיקה מה קרה בתהליכים שונים, במקומות שונים בעולם, איך מתרחשת הפרקטיקה הזאת, ובמפגש הזה אנחנו, אני לא אקרא לזה עולים מדרגה, אבל אנחנו ככה עולים לעבר העיסוק בתיאוריה בעצם של התחום הזה, של דמוקרטיה דליברטיבית, ובשביל זה הזמנו את פרופסור גראם סמית. אני רק רוצה לציין שאיתנו נמצאים פה חברים מתוך, מתוך היוזמה, דייוויד שתכף ידבר גם כן, כרמל, גורני, שמוליק ממרכז השל ויש לנו גם מצטרפים ככה חדשים שאני רואה שאני לא התכוננתי לסיטואציה הזאת שאני גם אציין את שמם עכשיו, בנצי ממרכז דיאלוגוס, ענת קדם ואני מקווה שלא פספסתי משהו. אז אנחנו שמחים שאתם פה. אני אגיד ש... Now, עכשיו אני הולך לעבור לאנגלית. So I'm switching to English right now. So we were happy to have Professor Graham Smith with us, which will talk, give a talk about the, the issue and topic of does deliber uh, deliberation, civic deliberation, can save democracy? האם דליברציה אזרחית אכן יכולה להציל את הדמוקרטיה? Well, he shall answer that. Uh, I might just add uh, uh, to this title uh, what we know. Uh, we know about the success Uh, of the Irish uh, Citizen Assembly in 2018, uh, but in return uh, we, we know about, uh, I don't know I, if we can call it a failure, but still don't know if it is a success, the French Citizen uh, Assembly, uh, which submitted its product uh, in the last summer of 2020, Uh, to uh, President Macron, 
uh, hoping uh, um, to implement uh, the recommendation of the assembly, uh, but now a year after that, uh, things got complicated. Uh, perhaps Graham will talk about that. Uh, when we don't see the implementation happening uh, any uh, anytime soon. So the question of can it help uh, democracy uh, is complicated. So I move to David to introduce Graham. David. Okay, I'm going to try. I've got some internet chat, but we'll try. We're delighted to have you here. Uh, we're really looking forward to that. Um, a bit of introduction, Graham. Graham Smith, Professor Graham Smith is probably on any, anywhere as anyone is talking about democracy, Graham is there. <laughs> He's a professor of politics and director of the Center for the Study of Democracy at the University of Westminster in the UK. His publications, Democracy, Democratic Innovations, Designing Institutions for Citizens, his latest book, Can Democracy Safeguard the Future? The Knowledge Network on Climate Assemblies, and Foundation for Democracy and Sustainable Development. And Graham has been very generous with us to, to come here to be with us. We've also consulted with him. Um, and uh, we, we will take this issue, which is a bit of a provocative question. Um, can deliberation models save democracy? And we, but there's a, there's a real issue around that because as we know around the world, there is an erosion of faith in our institutions, in our democratic institutions in many countries are very, very polarized. Um, the democracies are polarized as is Israel. And, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a real question. Are these models some sort of solution for what we're seeing in the downgrade of democracy? Um, so that's the opening question. Love to hear what you have to say about that, Graham. And we'll talk for about, you'll talk for about 20 minutes and then we'll open it up for questions. You should share a lot, but you bought the old case, swim the court, and you the shingle. So, Graham, the, the, the screen is yours. Okay. Thank you um, so much for the uh, introduction. Um, um, can you see my screen okay? Yeah. Sorry, we're moving ahead. Can, are you seeing it as a presentation or is it, um, or is it just, you, you, can, you can see it fine, can you? Yes, but uh, please uh, en enlarge it. You know how to yeah, enlarge I'm it. I'm trying to figure out how to get to my... It's in the bottom on the right, the, the television icon. Yeah, you can't see it from where I am though. I'm just getting, um, sorry. Uh, what you see isn't the same as what I see. <laughs> we see all the, uh, we see the slide, but we yeah. also can see uh, the other slides. Yeah, I'm on trying the, to- On the view menu, right on the view menu. Yeah, I'm trying to work out uh, view, view, there we go. Because I can't, I can't get down to the bottom. It's one of these strange things about, um, Oh, does anyone know how you the slideshow? Well, well, Play from start. There we go. Play from start. Does that work? Yes. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Okay, right. Sorry about that. Thank you so much, uh, David and Ronan, for such kind words and for inviting me to this um, session. Um, I was given the rather provocative title, although I, no I noticed that Ronan's version of it was was a bit broader. But I was at the the title that I understood was. Um, can citizens assemblies save democracy, which is a really big, <laughs> really, a really big question and one that I'll try to engage with um, in over the next over the next 20 minutes or so. The um, the short answer is no, and that is not the end of the presentation, but the short answer is that citizens assemblies or civic deliberation on its own won't save democracy. Uh, fortunately for this presentation, there is a but that there is more to say about this than than um, just simply that this isn't the answer to everything. And I want to suggest in this talk that citizens assemblies um, can really make a significant contribution to ameliorating some of the challenges and some of the issues that underpin our current uh, democratic discontents. Oops, sorry, um, oops, there we go. 
And uh, one of the things that I want to suggest is that citizens assemblies and other forms of civic deliberation, which we can we can talk about more as we go along, uh, offer a real, a rare beacon of hope for what democracy could become. There is so much about our current democracies that are problematic. It's really interesting to see a new institution and a new set of practices emerging that actually give us a sense of what we of how we could do things differently. And I think we can un we can under appreciate the fact that when a new set of practices emerge, they can offer us that possibility. And this fits with um, the way that uh, Eric Olin Wright talks about real utopias, this idea that the sort of future practices uh, that, that are, will be embedded within existing institutions that we've created, our future possibilities, we can see them within, within current practices. So I want to suggest that citizens' assemblies, although they won't be the answer to all of our problems, have real potential for helping us to think through how we might reconstruct and re restructure reform democracy. So in terms of the nature of our democratic discontent, I don't think I need to spend too much time on this, but there are a couple of issues that I, that I think we, ca we can think about this in two ways. One aspect of our discontent is, has been the failure of democracies to deal with some of the real pressing social and political issues. And I'm thinking here, particularly around climate change, but in the UK, dealing with issues around um, social care, emerging technologies, all these sorts of things that democracies don't seem to be very good at dealing with. And at the same time, as both Ronan and, um, and David mentioned, we've got this kind of rise of anti-democratic sentiments and practices, whether we think this is the rise of populism, or we think of this in terms of polarization. And so we've kind of got democracy not performing well in terms of in terms of actually giving us some of the outcomes that we would like to see but also its own practices coming under real pressure and, and its own and the sort of commitment to democracy coming under pressure and what i, I i'm suggesting and, and this comes from the most recent book that i've published which is has a virtue of being very short which is called uh, can democracy safeguard the future and i and in that book and I've kind of adapted this. I think there are so a number of drivers of our democratic discontent, and I and I'll kind of focus on um, four of them. One is the sort of party electoral motivations, and what this does, it, it does a number of things. But one of them is that it means that when we're trying to deal with really serious long-term issues, they get caught up with the short-term electoral cycles and polit and and partial political interests of political of particular political parties whose main interest is in securing power. So the kind of electoral cycles that we're working under and the kind of party motivations that that generates creates problems in terms of dealing with some of the real pressing issues we face. Secondly, we face a set of entrenched interests who have, who, who have, um, who have an interest in keeping things as they are or you know, keeping things as a safe sky. And I'm thinking here particularly around climate change, a particular organisations who Whose, whose, whose model of success is based on um, sort of high carbon dependency. We can also think of this in terms of capitalist dynamics, and there's been quite a lot of writing on around democracy being uh, about how um, capitalist dynamics have led to a sort of individualization of society, sort of expectations about politics and that politics should look like market relations somehow, and that politics becomes a disappointment because it doesn't deliver in the in the way we expect the kind of speed of uh, the acceleration of capitalism, meaning that you know people having to do you know the, the kind of um, uh, the the extent to which it's problematic for us to sort of sit back and think and reflect because things are moving so fast. And then another sort of classic problem is the sort of lack of presence of affected interests. But for me, I've got a particular interest around climate change, and of course, the people who are going to be most affected by that aren't present in the aren't present in the political system at the moment. But we can also think of this in relation to the kinds of people, the sort of distinction of the, the political class that emerges in most democratic societies who don't reflect the diversity of perspectives and interests within society. And therefore those perspectives and interests are overlooked. It's a very familiar feminist point, point for that. So there's a whole series of drivers here. And one of the suggestions I've got in this, in this short talk is that What's interesting about climate, about sort of citizens assemblies and other forms of civic deliberation is they actually give us ways of ameliorating some of these drivers. They give us ways of, of, of if you like, challenging some of these drivers. And I'll, I'll talk about that a bit more as we go along. So just 
I think everybody is probably aware of this, um, but it's worth just making sure. Uh, what, is a, what is a citizens assembly? What am I talking about here? I'm talking about a body which has been, which is made up of constituted by randomly selected participants who learn, deliberate and come to judgments on particular areas of public policy. Now this term citizens assembly tends to refer to a large scale body in at national level, 100, 150 people, local level, often around 50 to 70 people. But it, there's a whole set of practice out there. And Ronan mentioned the Irish Assembly. Well, you know, for years before that, there are there people practicing with citizens' juries, with planning cells, with consensus conferences, with deliberate deliberative polls. There's a whole series of mechanisms and technologies out there that use this principle of random selection and deliberation. And as you know, as uh, Ronan mentioned. The kind of explosion of interest in this really emerge, re really sort of catches fire after the apparent success of the Irish, the Irish Citizens Assembly, and now we have what the OECD, the Organisation of European Cooperation and Development, talk about as um, a deliberative wave that we're actually seeing much more of this practice. I, I always get slightly worried about the metaphor of deliberative waves for two reasons. One is it makes it sound as though these things are happening everywhere, which they aren't. This is still a very marginal practice. It's still something which doesn't happen very often. And the second is I always worry that a wave crashes. Um, so I'm worried that the, I'm worried that the metaphor, the metaphor isn't as, as, as useful a metaphor as we, as we might hope for, but it's, it's a term that's being used. And, you know, we can look to some really significant examples. For example, the, the already mentioned the Irish Citizens Assembly that led to constitutional changes in the in relation to abortion and affected climate change policy as well. We can look at the uh, first national assembly that happened in Scotland. They've now run a climate assembly as well. And, then, and as the, the, the sort of emergence of a whole series of climate assemblies in the UK. And again, one that was mentioned, the, the, the French convention. So what's happened in the last, I'd say, three to four years is that these processes have moved from what are often quite local processes, which are quite um, low key, low profile, and have been sort of thrown into, um, I, I've moved it to a higher national level, and that profile and potential impact has increased. So um, the promise of citizens assemblies is at least twofold. The first is that they clearly are able to deal, there is already evidence out there to show that they can deal effectively with issues that politicians often find difficult to deal with, that they can break political deadlock on, on quite controversial and complex issues, that they can deal effectively with social division. You know, these are randomly selected, so they are radically diverse um, political institutions, and yet they can embrace that diversity in ways that perhaps, you know, other other parts of democracy, social media, et cetera, can't. They can deal with complexity, they can deal with trade-offs, and they can deal with the long-term. So you can already see why I'm thinking that they ameliorate some of the drivers of democratic discontent that I mentioned earlier. And then secondly, we're beginning to get some evidence emerging, actually the most recent evidence coming out from France and from Germany, that the broader population has a higher level of trust in these sorts of in institutions than they do our established political institutions. So these are these institutions when when citizens learn about them, when when people learn about them, they tend to trust them. And it's for a variety of reasons. It's because they're made up of people like themselves. It's because of the learning that they do. It's because they are, if you like, some degree removed from the, um, the, the political system that many people judge is failing them. So I want to suggest that there are three characteristics of citizens assemblies, of deliberative processes that, that use random selection and deliberation that are of real value in terms of us thinking about how to do democracy differently. The first is their degree of independence. And we shouldn't be surprised um, that this is an important characteristic because um, when the, when the Athe ancient Athenians used random selection, it was actually to enable, enable governance to be effective in a situation where we had warring families, warring rich families who were undermine, consistently trying to undermine the position of other families. And although that's very different from our politics at the moment, although there are, there are some analogies that can be made, 
this takes it takes a political issue out of the sort of political contestation between political parties as not as, as an object of electoral politics and also potentially protects those people within the assembly from vested interests and that was actually as i say the athenians used it as a way of protecting their government from the vested interests of of these rich families so the first thing i think is really interesting about these bodies is they create a space of independence away from or just away from many of the um, uh, challenges and pressures that our current political institutions face. The second is their, their diversity. Through using mechanisms of random selection, and of course, you know, uh, for those of you who don't know, just very quickly, and if, I'm, if you all know this, I'm sorry. Uh, usually when you create a um, citizens assembly, you send out thousands of letters to households those people who are interested in participating send, a, send their response. And from those, you stratify, you, you use stratified sampling, if you like, quotas to ensure that you have the same number of men and women as in the broader society. You, you uh, do the same for age, for, gen, uh, for um, ethnicity, uh, for social class or for other, or for education, all those sorts of um, levels. So you've got a group of people who in many ways resemble the broader population. And for me, I don't think there isn't, well, I can't think of another institution within a democracy that, that has that degree of diversity. And what that ensures is that as you go through the policy, as you go through the deliberative process, you're drawing on the experience, the lived experiences of people from very, very different perspectives. And it means that you are testing ideas against those perspectives. And I don't think, as I say, that's such a rarity within our democratic institutions. And finally, is this quality of deliberation. These are spaces which are facilitated spaces. You can imagine if you bring 150, if you bring 50 people together random, who are randomly selected and just close the door on them, goodness knows what would happen. I mean, how, how, on, all, how on earth, uh, you know, what happens in terms of their, their organization and their interaction. So these spaces are facilitated typically by um, an independent body who provides the support to enable, to ensure equal participation by different people, to ensure that, uh, to ensure that no, in, no individual or group of individuals dominates over others. So these are spaces within which people learn. They're spaces in which people learn about each other's position as well as, well as uh, more general information from, from advocates and from, um, from witnesses. And it's a sort of space of mutual respect. So I think these kind of combinations of independence, of diversity and deliberation mean that we get out of the other end of these juries is a kind of space for public judgment, a place for public wisdom, which we simply don't have elsewhere in our political system. But, you know, I already said, you know, there are there, there are thing, questions we've got to raise. And, and Ronan mentioned, you know, the, the Parisian, the French assembly, maybe we can come back to that particular example. But I want to say that there's a kind of lack of institutionalization and embeddedness of these in, of, of, of assemblies. Too often they kind of they appear, they, they do their work and then they disappear. And there's no sort of sense of that these are become embedded within our political process. They sort of seem to at the moment that they, they aren't a, if you like, a standard part of our political decision making of our political of our, of our political institutions. And the second is that they are very rarely empowered. And we can think of empowerment in a couple of ways. One is in terms of the participants being able to make judgments about what issues to focus on. Very often it's established by political authorities and, and that's the sort of the task being set. And secondly, what comes out the other end of them often is not taken ser is not always taken seriously or, or is not, is not, um, doesn't have the effect that, what, that, that supporters of this would hope on the political process. And elsewhere, I've used this term cherry picking. What happens is that political authorities can cherry pick which issues they want assemblies on and what they don't want assemblies on. And they can cherry pick what they do with the outputs of them. Now, of course, political representatives have a, have a position within society, which means that they do have independence on whether they take things up. But the problem here is that there's a sort of selective listening to what comes out of uh, assemblies. Um, and I think the really good example here is climate assemblies, and Ronan's already mentioned that in relation to the French assembly, that very few of the proposals that came out of that assembly made it into the climate 
and resilience bill that's currently going through parliament and you know this is a question about how we link and if you like it's my first point how we embed these processes such that they are taken more seriously by those people with political power now i don't want to end with a kind of set of critiques of um assemblies without giving you some sort of sucker without giving you some sort of sense of that, that actually there's 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 something more here and what i want to suggest is that around the world we are seeing sort of emerging practice which is showing us how these assemblies and similar things to assemblies might be better integrated better embedded within our political processes the first is the permanent citizen dialogue which is in, in belgium in in the small german speaking part of germany and in there the the the, the the regional parliament has set up a permanent dialogue in which they have regular assemblies. For those assemblies, the decisions on what is the assembly going to be on is, is the decision of another randomly selected body called the Citizens Council, which is a permanent body with its membership changing over time. Every 18 months, it's, it, it, the, the, membership, the membership changes. And that council gets to set the agenda for assemblies and also provides oversight to see what happens to the what comes out the other end of assembly so we've, we've they've created this body that if you like plays that role in plays a role of empowering that we don't see elsewhere also in belgium in brussels in the in the um, brussels parliament we're seeing the emergence of mixed legislative assembly uh, committees where legislators work with randomly selected citizens on particular policy problems so that's a really another really interesting development in poland we've seen uh, the practice emerging where municipal mayors agree to commit, they, they agree to implement proposals where there is 80% support or more from within the assembly before the assembly makes its recommendation. So there's already a, a, pre, a, a, a commitment beforehand. And interestingly, in, in Scotland, the new, the new nationalist, the new, the new SNP, Scottish Nationalist Party administration, has promised to establish an annual assembly process and at the moment, I'm part with others trying to figure out exactly how that will work. So some of the problems that I mentioned about cherry picking are being picked up by some of these developments um, in emerging practice around the world. So I want to kind of end with a couple of, couple of points. And I'll go back to what I initially said. Citizens assemblies alone will not save democracy. They are, you know, they are just simply not a robust enough institution to sort out all of democracy's problems. But, sorry. I've just thought that we have we have a real critical task in front of us, which is democracy in many ways is, you know, we, we know is under pressure and we need to engage in an imaginative and creative task of rebuilding democracy. And we can think of uh, citizens assemblies in two ways. One of them, we can think of them. They are a, an institution which can have a role within democracy and can play some of these roles in dealing with pressing political questions in ameliorating some of the drivers of democratic discontent. And that they will have an they can and should have an important role and there are ways of building them into democracy the other is to do what i would say which i did before which was to say there are some important features about citizens assemblies even if we don't even if they die as an idea and they don't the practice doesn't doesn't establish there are these ideas of independence of diversity and of deliberation that we know are valuable for responding to some of democracy's discontents so citizens assemblies may be part of the answer, but I think we should use those kinds of principles to also think about creating other sorts of dem uh, other sorts of political and democratic space in which we can renew and restructure democracy. So I'll leave it there. And I'm really delighted to talk to you about anything I've talked about in this in this uh, talk, but also about any particular examples that you that you may have that you'd like to know more about. So thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much, Graham. Do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Okay, great. Um, for as long as it lasts. Um, that was great. That was both inspiring and grounded at the same time, which is uh, <laughs> hard, hard to do. <laughs> hard task with that question. But um, I want to open it up to questions that people may have. Um, you're welcome to write in the chat. If you don't want to ask in English, you can write it in, in Hebrew and we can we can translate it for you. Um, um, 
I think you raised a lot of important issues that we're, we're, we're trying to get our heads around here as well. Um, so let's have uh, some questions. Who would like to start? Jump in. Let to start. Go ahead. Uh, can you elaborate on the uh, Belgian, uh, Polish, Scotland examples and what do they show or what of it can be adopted for the future? Yeah, of course. Delighted to. Um, and, and ask me as I'm speaking, please jump in if you want me to, to, to say more. So um, the, the Belgian um, parliament and government and parliament uh, came to, I, I was one of the experts involved in this, but they came to an organization called G1000, which, which is a famous organization in Belgium, with the question about how they done, they done, they done citizens assemblies. And their question was, how can we make this more of a regular part of our politics and not just kind of an ad hoc thing, a one, one off thing? And I think they, so, which was a really interesting question to be asked because you don't normally get that question. Normally, politicians are interested in thinking about how they can use them for their particular issue. Um, and at the time, there was this kind of idea that, the, that maybe what we could create was a, was a second chamber of randomly selected citizens. And we, for various reasons, we thought, um, we thought this wasn't such a good idea. But what we did is we create this system where um, you have two bodies or two sets of bodies. One of them is this thing called a citizens council. And the citizens council is a permanent body. And it has about, I think, I can't remember exactly, but I think it has around 30 members. And 10 members, are every, every six months, 10 members are changed. So there's a constant rotation of the people involved in it. And that body gets to decide what the next citizens assembly is to focus on. It takes evidence from parliament, it takes evidence from government, it takes evidence from civil society organizations and from businesses, but it decides on, the, on, on behalf of the, um, of the citizens of, uh, of East Belgium, what, what topic should, should we have an assembly on? Now, the important thing is they, don't, they, they aren't the assembly. They, a, a, a standard citizens assembly is then established and that citizens assembly does its work um, and when it makes its report, it goes to Parliament as a special committee where the Parliament responds to the, to the outcomes. And usually that's quite common in, in citizen assembly practice. But what's really important after that is now everyone's gone home. All the participants of the citizen assembly has gone, have gone home. But the members of the citizen council can consistently ask the government and ask the Parliament, what have they done with the proposals? So it's that constant checking and monitoring that is often missing from most citizens assemblies because most citizens assemblies make their recommendations then all the citizens go home and there is no body that is sort of takes responsibility for ensuring that you know the, the government at least justifies what it's doing and so this this citizen council has become a really important body and they've only it's only been around for a year or two and it's really hard to with covid it's really hard to judge how how well it's embedded but the people but the politicians in East Belgium feel that this is a really interesting development. And there, East Belgium is quite a small area. It's kind of, um, Ost Belgium has something like 80, 70, 60 or 80,000 inhabitants of adults. So quite quickly, lots of people will get an invitation to be part of this process. And, it, and the idea is it will become embedded as, as another branch, of, gov of, another branch of, of the legislature, if you like, but a very different sort of input. In just very quickly in Poland, the interesting development there is that um, the organization that runs assemblies in, in that is the kind of best, the leading organization to run assemblies in, in, that, in that country uh, has a contract with the mayor of the city that they will implement anything that, anything that comes out which has 80% support and is, and is constitutional. <laughs> <laughs> I've got it important to say that it's got to fit, it's got to be constitutional. Um, and it is argued that there was a there was a um, uh, a citizens assembly on flood defenses in Gdansk. And it's argued that because of this 80 percent threshold, 
now Gdansk has much better flood defences than it would have had without that process, that there would have been a cherry picking process otherwise. So these are just examples of the, the Belgian one, I think, is interesting because it's giving power to citizens to decide what issues the process, the, the, the assembly should be on. And it's providing an oversight mechanism, which is often missing. The Polish example is interesting because it's empowering. The, final, the decisions that are made by the, if, if there's big enough support, the decisions that are made by this assembly have mandatory, have a degree of mandatory force. I mean, it's still up to the mayor whether to do it or not, but they've made that commitment beforehand. And Scotland, I think, is, is more of a watch this space because they've done two assemblies now in two years and they've committed to carry on doing it during the current assembly, uh, the, the new parliament, which has only just been established. So there's going to be another five years of practice. And I and other people are involved of working with civil servants, trying to figure out how you embed that better with the existing policy system. So, so I just think that I, I, I mentioned those because it's too easy to point to the one to those assemblies where things haven't worked so well. And um, maybe we'll talk about the French one because I think there's an interesting story there. Um, but you know, I think it's really important to point to where the, if you like, the cutting edge of practices where people are trying to do new things. So I think. Those three that I've said to you are really interesting because of the way they're trying to institutionalize, because of the way they're trying to empower the assemblies. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes, of course. It's more than answering. Okay. Thank you. It's really exciting. Yeah, yeah, yes, it's really exciting. Shmulik is part of our initiative. Good. Yes, and um, maybe, maybe you should talk a little bit about the French one. What's, what's, what's gone wrong there? Even though you didn't, even though you didn't want to talk about places where things got wrong, but it's interesting. No, 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 no. But I don't think I don't think things have gone wrong. Okay, so I mean, things have gone wrong in the sense that it, it was there's a there was there was an enormous political naivety on the on the part of President Macron. So so this what I'm telling you now is from obviously I'm not French and I I I speak some French, but I I haven't been embedded in the process. But but this is what I understand from my my friends. Is he didn't know what he was doing when he started this process. He didn't. He didn't know what a climate assembly was, and he did, he certainly didn't think that they would be able to generate laws and regulations and things. So he didn't think he was committing to anything serious. So so first problem is you've got a politician who who doesn't know what they're doing, and he made this promise where he said there will be no filter. So he said any proposals that you make, if they come out as reg regulations or laws as referendum, we will we will take them for well it wasn't clear what he was promising at that point but he, he promised too much um and so the other thing he didn't do was he, he this was a rushed process he rushed into this without consulting with parliament so one of the things parliament felt was that it was being over it was being overridden by this process that it was being ignored by by the president and there's all sorts of tensions between parliament and president as you can imagine so this was born into a very very highly contested political process where most of the people involved didn't know what a climate assembly was but they were organized but they were they were sponsoring one the assembly was really interesting and we can talk about some of the detail of it and i'm very happy to but and it produced something like 150 recommendations which for the by the way i think is too many recommendations because the opportunity then for governments to cherry pick is is, is bigger but anyway that's a we can come back to that that's more of a technical issue so when they when they made their proposals the government um, wasn't happy with some of them it just realized that it, it, it wasn't willing to act as as it had been suggested and then as it went through parliament with various it, through the bill various things were modified and changed now that looks as though it's been a really bad process but what has happened is, is it's become a, an object of significant public debate most people in France know about the convention. Most people in France support the convention that they've actually, you know, they say they, 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 they trust the convention and its decisions more than they trust the government and they would like to see the government implement them. And so you've got this really interesting situation where it's become much more political, where the kind of politics of assemblies has become an object of public debate. Now, for me, that's not a failure. If you told me five years ago that France would run a, an assembly where there, which would generate public debate about assemblies and about their role in the political process, that would 
have the president having to justify on television why he wasn't doing certain things. I actually think this is a really interesting, I would have said, I don't believe you five years ago. I can't believe that's going to happen. So I think it's a short term problem in that, you know, what it's so what is is exposed is this inter we need to do much more work on the interface between assemblies and the policy system between assemblies and between the political system. And so the French assembly more than any other has really shown us that that is really necessary. But I don't see it, as I say, I don't see it as a failure just simply because of the degree of public debate, public knowledge, public understanding about assemblies and the degree to which that's shown us that there is support amongst the public for these sorts of processes. And about climate change, I would take it, that also has become yeah. really upfront. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, the, and the idea that the voice of citizens is important in that, in that process. Right, right. That's good. That's good. Thank you, Graham. I've seen... Um, Omer was raising his hand very politely. <laughs> Omer came on from Digitally. Dialogos. Digitally. Hi, Graham. Uh, thank you for the fascinating talk. Um, so I have uh, two short questions. The first is, do you think, uh, do you see this practice as a tool for capacity building in the sense that citizens can participate uh, in continued discussions about the implication of former uh, assemblies? And uh, the other one is, uh, what is your take on the role of new media or digital platform for deliberation in this kind of practice? Yeah. So is your first question, do you, do, when you're talking about your first question, Omar, do you mean um, it, capacity building in terms of what, this, what the citizens who are participating then go and do? Yeah, or, yeah. And, and may, maybe they will choose, may, maybe they will, will choose to, to participate again in uh, future assemblies. Yeah, so, so first on that one, you, you actually don't want the people who've participated in past assemblies to be in future assemblies because you always want to have, you know, you want to have more different people. It, that's the sort of, that's the logic of random selection. But what is clear is most people come out of these processes they, and, and the, the evaluation, the people love doing this. It's really hard to believe when people come into these processes, they, they typically saying, why did you invite me? I don't know anything about this. I can't do this. And at the end, they're really infused and really their, 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 their efficacy, their sense of efficacy is really, really increased. And so there is lots of evidence of, for example, of the climate assembly in the UK, they followed up the assembly members to see what they were doing. And a lot of them were involved in climate, climate related activities. Now, the issue though, is that this is a small number of people. This is only like 100, 150 people. And I think the really big question is how we can, how we can integrate, um, integrate climate assemblies into bigger processes of public deliberation. And interestingly, that's what's interesting about France. It is part of a bigger debate now about, about climate change, about, about deliberation. So, so they, they, are, they do build the capacity of people who are involved in them. There's no question about that. But because the, they only involve a small number of people, that's not, I mean, you're seeding, you're seeding small, you know, lots of activists, I guess. But so, that, so there is some evidence of that. Um, in terms of new media, so there's a couple of things to say there. COVID has forced the hand of most assemblies. They've all, they've all been online. So first of all, you know, things like Zoom and you know, other technologies being used by the assembly. Yeah. So, so you know, the, the Scot Scotland's climate assembly was, was completely on Zoom. There were no face-to-face, -face, no, no in-person meetings at all. So they're already having to use technologies. Um, I think there's a really big debate about how you link these processes with the broader civil society and how you can bring people in. And it's surely new media has a role to play there. And I think we, we, it has a role to play at the start when you are um, when you're trying to um, when you're trying to understand the definition of the problem, the, the sort of scope of the problem, and that you know getting inputs from all sorts of different people really can help and I think there's some really there's real possibility of using what what's often referred to as argument visualization software to, to help to help understand public's views before before the process starts I think there's real potential to to use a, an assembly's existence to seed other deliberations in society on the same issue so it can be used as a sort of as a catalyst for other things and that can be done through new media and I think when the when the results come out 
I think they can and should be the basis of public discussion, which again could be done through new media. So I think there's a danger that, the, of course, the danger of new media is it can be, you know, it can lead to polarization, but it can be, it can be designed in ways that 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 isn't the case. And there's always going to be Twitter wars. There's always going to be <laughs> those sorts of things. But I think what you're pointing to is something which we really need to do more work on, which is trying to figure out how these things are valuable in the way that they can give that they in the in the way they can help develop policy but they're also valuable in the way that they can lead to broader public debate and lead to broader public engagement and that second thing i think is where new media comes in and it's where we've seen less development but i think it's a really exciting area and just one thing on that i think there's a group of people who i would refer to as civic tech people people who are using civic tech, technology for civic reasons. And you have the people who are interested in deliberative democracy working on citizens assemblies, citizens juries. And those two groups of people don't talk to each other or don't talk to each other enough. And I think there's a really creative conversation to be had between those people who are at the leading edge of civic tech and those people who are working on deliberation. They're sort of slightly suspicious of each other, but um, I think there's a really creative conversations to be had there. I agree. Thank you. No worries. I think uh, Omer is one of those people who are the bridges. Good. Good. <laughs> um, Ido has a, two rather complicated questions. He put it in the chat, um, which I didn't really understand either, Ido. Maybe you could explain them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, hi, hello. Thank you very much. Uh, nice to meet you, Ido. It's really enlightening to. Uh, to be in this conversation. I, um, my, my first question is about, both the questions are about design, uh, about the, uh, designing uh, citizen assemblies as you, as you uh, see them, as you have experienced. Um, the first is about um, diversity representativeness and the different considerations that might play into that and in how, um, in how we might learn from your experience on that going into such a process. Um, and I, I'd like to point out that our assembly is planned for a um, regional or municipal uh, kind of deliberation environment, uh, which, is, which, is not, which is not the general population. So how would we um, think about diversity in, in such a case? Obviously the whole country can uh, be influenced from one municipality perhaps, uh, there's different uh, ways to do that. And the second question is about the actual uh, stages of deliberation. Um, and it seems to me that there's a, some sort of tension between uh, talking about the issues and allowing for imaginative interplay or imaginative work within the group and perhaps uh, even more uh, radical thinking and, and, and construction of utopias and so on. Uh, in, in, I think this is well, well based in political theory, but I'm not sure this is so much in design of deliberation. Uh, um, and so these are the two questions. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, they're really good questions. Um, first of all, a lot, most, most assemblies, let, let's stop talking about, I, I'm using assemblies as a generic term here. So most deliberative mini publics, most randomly selected deliberative processes have happened at the city level. So, so that's the common level. And, and that then, it's the, it's the geography of the, typically the geography of the political institution that you're talking to, mm -hmm. the, the boundary of the political institution you're talking to, which is usually the basis on which you select membership. Now, that for an issue like climate, that has problems because that doesn't mean that everyone who is affected is, is in, it, but you know, this is a typical political problem of, of trying to define who the constituency is. There's always this problem. Is it should it be based on all affected interests, all subjected, you know, all these kind of questions keep are all yeah, traditional questions of political theory, basically. But um, we would usually, so most of the most of the assemblies I've been involved in have been municipal assemblies, and you would usually use the um, some sort of register like an electoral register or some some other register for that for that constituency that gives you the maximum number of people within that constituency. And then the issue of diversity is, um, so the idea is for within that constituency to, so the two things you think about here, one is 
we want to create a body that looks like the, the political constituency in the politically salient characteristics of that issue. Okay. Mm. Or the, or the things, so for example, you would always choose to ensure that you've got equality, you know, so you've got, you've got equal numbers of men and women, that you make sure that you have people at different ages, that you make sure that you have um, people. Is it true that in Ireland they polled um, uh, young people higher than their actual uh, uh, percentage in the population? So that's what I was, get, that's what I was going to yeah, say. Okay. To you. Sometimes, so, so usually the standard is to try and get a group that uh, looks like the current population. In that, you, you might oversample for two reasons. Okay, one is you might oversample because you know that um, younger people, for example, are less likely to turn up. So you might invite more younger people because you know the likelihood is that they, will, they won't turn up. Although that, a lot of that is to do with how good your support process is, your capacity building process is. So, you know, the Scottish Climate Assembly invited 108 people and 105 people finished the whole process. You know, so they did it really, really well. Uh, and, you know, that was really impressive. Um, so sometimes you oversample, you invite more of a certain social group because they are less likely to come. That might be one thing you do. The other thing you might do is you might oversample because you politically want to oversample. So there are arguments like for climate change. You might, I've seen people make the argument that you should have more younger people in the assembly, even more than there are in the population because they are the ones who are going to have to live with the consequences of it. But that is a political decision that has to be made. There is no right answer here about this. So in, in the, and again, I mentioned in the UK, when um, we ran the um, UK Climate Assembly, we asked people about their concern for climate change to make sure that we had people who were not concerned about climate change in the assembly in order that we had that kind of variety of perspectives. So, these might be demographic characteristics. They might be about age, gender, social class, those sorts of things, or they might be about attitude. And it, again, in um, we ran a, a, a pilot assembly many a few years ago on, on Brexit after we decided to leave the European Union. We ran one on what should Brexit look like. And we used Brexit vote as one of our criteria because we wanted to make sure we had the same number of leave voters as remain. Because if we'd had an assembly full of remain voters, people would have said it's just, so you've kind of got to judge what is it that is significant? What is, what is the diversity I'm trying to achieve here? What is the nature of that diversity? And that might change from assembly to assembly. And your, in terms of your second question, it's always a really interesting problem or not problem. It's, a, it's an interesting design challenge to um, not just overwhelm people with sort of standard expert advice, if you like, you know, with, with kind of witness, just on witness kind of after witness telling them about climate change or whatever the issue is. And the real skill is, is, is ensuring that you've got enough input so that people understand the dimensions of the problem and giving them that space to be creative. And I think most people who have run, who have run assemblies, you know, not most people, a lot of the best organizations manage to make do that balance really well. Um, and one of the things that we're coming to realize is, is it's important to give more time to deliberation, to recommendation writing, to the creative part of it than it is to the sort of input of information, if you, you know, the sort of standard input of, of information. And so you, you see now the kind of balance of so in the week, the, 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 the climate assembly in Scotland had. I think seven seven weekends, and at least three of those weekends were deliberate. Were, there was no input. They were, there were creative spaces for participants to start building recommendations together. So is that this is a real balance? There's no right answer either. It's kind of like you. And one of the things it's a bit like when you when you learn when you first get your job as a lecturer, you you try and you try and tell your students too much. You kind of try, you try and give too much information, and you realise they've got no space to discuss it. It's always happened. And I think the same can be true of assemblies. The early assemblies were, were too information heavy and not enough creative space. So it's finding that balance. And any good, any good designer of these spaces, like Involve in the UK or Mission Publique in France, can give you that advice about how to balance that. Sorry, can you say the names again? <laughs> yeah, Involve 
involved in the UK. I got it. I got it. You got it. Okay, great. Thank they're, you. They're members, um, of, they're members of an organization called Democracy R&D, which David and um, Ronan are members of. So there's a, there's a bunch of maybe about 20 or 30 really respected organizations around the world who can help you with questions of process design. Thank you. But, but you know, what both of the things you mentioned are really challenging. And so just, just as a quick aside, in, in France, they, they didn't use ethnicity as one of their, one of their, um, uh, one of their selection criteria, because actually it's constitutionally illegal to do it. You're not allowed to do it. And I can imagine that you're going to have similar issues in relation to, um, you know, kind of uh, dif different ethnic groups within within Israel about how do you deal with that kind of those kind of issues. I don't, and I don't know whether there are going to be political or constitutional constraints to whether you can select according to that. But, you know, you these are issues that are local and that you'll have to try and figure out. It's a, I, it's you've hit the, the nail on the head. It's going to be an issue for us for sure. Um, but I, I have a question that I, I, a lot of people in the room are going to be involved in the you know, first local citizens assembly, at a local authority or regional authority. Um, what would you say to people who are debating whether they want to have a citizen? What, what's in it for them in terms of what you think would be um, for a local authority to take it on? And by the way, I want, to, I want to also say that we don't have funding for this evening. We're asking them to put most of the resources in we'll give them as much love as it, and attention and, <laughs> and and political and 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 professional support but so what's in it for them in, in your view from what you've seen on the local level and and if you've got any tips for us who are trying to do it um what would you say what would you what should we look out for beyond the things that you've said about about um um you know, sampling and so on and so forth. What what is an important takeaway for us to think about in terms of local assemblies? Yeah, um, yeah. Just writing a couple of things down. Okay, so first of all, there is there is no sort of general answer to this because it's kind of context context specific in terms of thinking about why somebody some assemblies emerged and others you know others didn't and you know the the you know going back to France if you hadn't had the yellow vest protests if you hadn't had Macron in trouble, you probably wouldn't have had a climate assembly. Um, so they, they all come from different, they all, they all emerge for different reasons in different ways. Um, one of the things that a guy called Ian Walker, who is the director of New Democracy, and New Democracy is a really important organisation. It's based in Australia, but it also supports, it, it, this is a really rare thing. Actually, these are people you should talk to, actually. The guy who run, who, there's a guy called Luca who, who, um, funds new democracy and he's basically a, a millionaire and he's put some of his money into 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 supporting assemblies around the world so he's he's obviously someone you go and talk to <laughs> so, but ian ian um, walker basically goes to political leaders and he says what's your biggest political problem what's your biggest political headache what's the thing that you can't sort out what's the thing that has been on your agenda for years and you just can't take it forward what's the thing that's causing you to, to stay awake at night and, and so he kind of said and th that's what we'll do a citizens assembly on that's what we'll do we'll help so we'll help you solve your really difficult problem so at the moment for example in my local town there's a big problem about the, about traffic and yeah, the, the future of this the, the the city because of post-covid and there's big debates about amongst the political parties they can't agree and some local entrepreneurs have come in and said we'll help you solve this problem and our and we'll use a citizens assembly to help you deal with this problem so one of them is kind of identifying people who have got really difficult political problems where they know they need to act but they are somehow in deadlock or there's some difficulties for them so that's one that's one kind of strategy the, the other is um to play on the fact that this is going to be the first in israel you know to play on the fact that you know, you are going to, you are chance appear to be a real political entrepreneur. And at that point, it's great to pull in people from around the world who can tell them how great they, how great it will be. You know, that someone from Ireland, you know, people, I, I've done this for various people where I've come and talked about how this is, this is an emerging practice and how it's kind of like the, at the forefront of democratic practice. You wouldn't believe how many politicians want to be the first, you know, they, they just like that a lot. And one of the reasons that, this little place in East Belgium is the place where we have the first permanent citizens assembly, citizens dialogue. 
is because they wanted to be the first people to be to institutionalize this process. They want so they 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 were active in that. So I think playing on the fact that you could help somebody with a really difficult decision they face, and then playing on their own kind of pride and their own you know the kind of the sense in which you know they they could be first. They this this will be this will mean that they are always remembered as the first people in Israel to do this. Those two things are nice ways in. That that would be my kind of um, of way. And as I say, also laying on thick the kind of in you know bringing bringing people into conversations with them who can bring their international experience and say how how well it worked in those in their in their municipalities. If you if you haven't noticed, that's what you're doing. <laughs> Right I have now. A, I have a I have another another question if you finish Graham. Okay. I'm going back to the national level. Uh, well, uh, I'm interested in your skill as a for giving us a prophecy. Uh, <laughs> how far do you think we are uh, from the point uh, that any particular uh, democracy, especially the ones that have already uh, two houses of parliament like Britain, uh, will decide uh, to, ins- uh, as you call it, to institutionalize, uh, inst- institutionalize uh, deliberative democracy by uh, shifting one of their uh, houses of parliament to be a citizen assembly. Uh, I know uh, that uh, even on uh, popular jo- uh, journalism in Britain, uh, there were suggestions like that about the House of Lords. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it, is it, is it uh, uh, are, 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 are there any real discussions about <laughs> such a uh, such a thing which is uh, quite radical to decide yeah. upon yeah yeah so so I'll, I'll say a couple of things there Ronan. the first is that I'm not sure that I believe that's a good idea um, mm. which is which is the simple idea not and I'm not saying you're saying this necessary but the simple idea which is which I've seen some people suggest particularly the sortition foundation which is kick the kick the politicians out and put the randomly selected citizens in and don't you And the issue there is these institutions have been developed with a certain with us based on a certain form of political representation we've actually developed so I'm just got some sun in my eyes won't be a second we've we've developed these institutions um, have, have evolved over time based on sort of electoral principles based on well originally not electoral but you know kind of on some sort of representative principles principle and then we're talking about just radically changing this by putting randomly selected citizens in my sense is we're also going to have to change the institution itself it wouldn't look the same as the legislature we have just simply with randomly selected citizens instead of parliamentarians and I've written some stuff with the guy called David Owen on this there's a book a really nice book called um, oh gosh what's it called I'm trying to find it now um, I think it's called legislature by lot. Which was produced by Olin uh, Eric Olin Wright, and I can send details of you, which is this big debate about what this should look like. And I think you can use assemblies to do legislative fun to play legislative functions, but I don't think it would be a single assembly myself. I don't think that would be the case. No, In- just uh, I, I meant as a second house of power. No, 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 I understand no, I understand. But that was still a legislative thing. I, I, so I won't get into the sort of debate about about design, but in okay. a sense, in a sense, The East Belgium model takes us some of the way there, some of the way, not all of the way, but it takes us some of the way. I actually think you're likely to not to see this in the UK or in Canada or where we've got these second houses, but actually in the places which are currently only got one legislature. So even even you know I'm, I don't think it will be Israel, but it could be it could be somewhere in, um, in, in Belgium. Because Belgium has got all sorts of governance crisis at the moment and is very interested in random selection. So we've already seen what's happened in East Belgium. We've already seen these joint committees in Brussels of randomly selected citizens and par- parliamentarians. And I think that we could imagine at a regional level or at a national level, somebody actually creating a new body. What I can't imagine is elected representatives voting themselves out of a job. 
and replacing there. So, so, so I think it's more likely to come where you've got unicameral systems, single, single legislatures. And my guess is if it's going to happen, it's going to be Belgium. An outside bet would be would be Scotland. But I think um, Bel both Belgium and Scotland have got active civil society organisations campaigning for that. Mm -hmm. OK. So, no, but I'm, I'd, I'm happy to chat about that idea and send you other things around it. But um, All right, I want to I, I want to open up for more questions. I, it seems that we've become like sort of a boys conversation till now. Um, and um, there are a lot of women in the room and other people who would like to say something or ask a question. Go right ahead. Jump in. That's putting pressure on on women to ask. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pressure. That's putting pressure. Not fair. <laughs> yeah, that's not fair. Well, then it's I'll just. I, 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 there's someone I, here. I, I don't have to put pressure because I'm sure she has a question if she's Ariella. in the room. Leah, yeah. Leah, are you here? Ariella was just waving then as well. Leah, Leah, are you here? Oh, Ariella, let's let, oh, let's yeah. uh, introduce Ariella. Yes, I am here. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm for your question. Oh, but Ariella first. Hi, yeah, I, I can ask a question. Um, so something I'm very interested in, uh, and we might have discussed this already, Graham, um, is who writes the recommendations in these assemblies, because this is something that really varies and can really affect the outcomes. Yeah, so um, I think a lot of it is depend. So, so I think there's one of the things that, um, we have to remember is there are, and you're pointing to here, is that there are very different designs on, which use the same name of citizens assemblies. And if we compare the Climate Assembly UK for, to, to the French Assembly or to the Scottish Assembly, the Climate Assembly UK asked its, asked its participants to make judgments about policy proposals that were put forward by, by a group of experts. So option A, option B, option C, if you like, and which of these do you like? Whereas in France and Scotland and in other assemblies, those the, the, um, the participants wrote their proposals and recommendations from scratch. They, they came out from their own ideas and from their own in, engagement with, with um, witnesses. Um, I have a you know from a sort of democratic perspective i i i guess i have a uh, preference for the second approach because it because these are these are um ideas that are then constructed and guided by the interests of citizens and not not primarily by by um political or or expert expert leads but i also recognize that there is a role there is a potential role for um, these sorts of bodies to break deadlock when there are policy options ahead of you. So, for example, in the UK, we will have to make a decision at some point soon about whether or not we um, heat our houses using uh, electricity or hydrogen. And that is a real, there's no, it's an either or, it's one or the other. We have to make a decision or we might. And so actually, Having an assembly or a group of randomly selected citizens deliberating on that policy choice strikes me as a very reasonable thing to do. But if that policy choice, there was another choice which the government was hiding and those weren't the policy choices, then that would be problematic. So I think, there, I think we rec should recognise that this idea of randomly selected citizens deliberating and coming to judgments can be used in very different ways. Um, and sometimes it might be useful in a more sort of technocratic sense in a sort of more poly, you know in a much more sort of instrumental sense to help us break a particular policy make a particular policy choice where those policy choices are obvious um, and in a sense that's sort of what the climate assembly uk model suggests do you, i mean do you have views on this ariella because you've talked about this a lot yeah well, well i tend to agree with you it depends what the purpose of the assembly of the deliberative process is, um, but I can see it really closing up the deliberation when the recommendations are voted upon 
from pre-written recommendations. Mm -hmm. But I really understand the value it has if you need to make a decision between a few options mm -hmm. and there isn't much flexibility. So I agree mm -hmm. that it just depends what you're- and I, and I think I think what you've got to be upfront at the start is, is to the participants and to the more general public about what you're doing with this forum and being upfront about saying, look, we're restricting choice here, you know, we're, and we're doing it for the following reasons. So I think as long as you're as long as you're up front to participants and they understand what they're doing and why they're doing it and that it will have an effect. I think that's, I can't see that that's not an unreasonable thing to do. The other thing you can do as well, and I was talking to somebody yesterday, actually you put me in touch with him, Stuart, Stuart Candy, who's a futurist, someone who talks about, who works on future studies and the, about the way that, you know, the work that you've been doing about how you might use um, different futures, the present different futures to people and immerse people in those futures um, and to help them think about different possibilities. Of course, you've got to make choices about what those futures are. And, you, and at that point, you're, you're actually structuring the thinking of the participants. So even every choice we make, and this goes back to an earlier point that Ido was making about, about um, you know, how much information do we give people, et cetera. Every time you give people information, you are, you're, you're, you are structuring the ways of thinking. And we should get away from thinking that we can create these assemblies which don't have those kind of characteristics and just accept that that is the case and make that visible to people. I think it's also about trust, meaning uh, the question, if you trust uh, or if the public trusts uh, the body that actually facilitates and organizes it, or uh, then these questions, of course, are important, as you all already explained, you and Ariella, uh, but, there's, uh, but there's also, it's, it's related also to the trust uh, in, the, in the whole project, meaning if you don't trust it, you might find uh, a way to explain uh, how the participants were manipulated uh, in any way. And I think that any uh, usage of any practice uh, uh, implies some sort of uh, manipulation, you, you might call it, uh, yeah. even not intentionally doing. Uh, yeah, I mean, manipulation isn't necessarily a bad thing, you know, so I mean, it's, it, it, it has, it has negative, so let's not use the word manipulation because it, because it has a yes, terrible connotation. Yes. But the, um, the, I think what's what you're pointing to there as well, Ronan, is the importance of getting the governance structures of the process right. So when I was when we ran the Citizens Assembly on Brexit, which I mentioned before, as part of our advisory board, we had the strongest remainers. We had the Scottish government on our advisory board, and we also had UKIP, which is the nationalist remove, let's leave Europe, get out of Europe party. And we had a representative of both of those on our advisory group in order that afterwards when people said oh this was all remain or it was all leave we could say no go and ask these people on our advisory board because they will vouch for the fact that we did this fairly and that they they saw the process they checked the process so there's some really interesting questions about how you construct your advisory board such that you i think one of the things i pieces of advice i give to people is think through who's going to criticize you and then make sure someone they 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 trust is on the advisory board. <laughs> it's kind of like it's you know think ahead of yourself to where you're going to get the problems and make sure that you have those people in the in, inside rather than outside. I would like to add a question exactly about this. Uh, thank you very much. It's very interesting, and I think the matter of trust is extremely important. But the framing of the questions, the way we frame them actually hide inside them already the kind of solutions that we are seeking. So the way we frame is, is very, very important and it's not manipulation. I mean, it's a uh, no. framing is part of the, of the way uh, we do things. Now, you can't avoid we, live it. In very, we live in very unusual times and very unusual times, uh, um, I think really need new framings and new paradigms. And I wonder if you can give from your examples, uh, a, a, an example where uh, somehow a citizen assembly managed to get out of the uh, usual framing of things and actually be presented with a, with a new paradigm like degrowth or, uh, or uh, things like that. And actually uh, 
suggests solutions that come from a different kind of economic thinking, a different kind of our place in the universe, in, the, in, the, in Gaia, and things like that. Do you have any example of such a thing? Um, I have. I, I can take us towards an example. So I, so I have. So part of my job now, and it was mentioned, I think, in, my, in the introduction, is I'm now chair of an organisation called the Knowledge Network on Climate Assemblies. So one of the things we're trying to do is, is try to make is to, is to try and learn the lessons of what worked and what didn't work in the existing climate assemblies and work with those people who are who are bringing forward climate assemblies to try and make them the best possible spaces they can be and part of that is about is about the question that they're asked and the task that they're asked so the early climate assemblies apart from the, the irish one is a is a strange one but we'll so i'll leave that to one side but the uk one and the um and the French one, both were asked, basically, how can we achieve a certain reduction of CO2? So UK has a legislative commitment to um, net zero by 2050. So they, they, the question was, how does the UK achieve net zero by 2050? In France, it was like, how does France reach, I think, 60%, some, some percentage by 2035? And I can't remember what the percentage was. And what what um, what they produced is like a policy menu. These are the policies you need to achieve that. And they were criticised by some people within the climate movement for not doing what you say, for not asking the bigger questions around the growth imperative, not asking those sort of questions about how do we think about progress. And partly that's because the questions sort of asked them for what are the kind of policies that we need to have in place and didn't really ask them about systems change, didn't ask them to think about alternative futures. Um, and it's noticeable that in Scotland, they had a different approach, which was they asked the advisory group to come up with the question. They actually did a deliberative process with the advisory group to come up with it. And the, the, I, can't, I haven't got the question right to hand right now, but it's, it's something like, how does Scotland need to change in order to deal with the climate crisis? Now, what that did was that was that meant that citizens were immediately faced with this issue of change, of thinking about change, and, and not just thinking about technical questions about policies. They also, they weren't particularly, um, they, they weren't doing all the things that Ariella would want to see, but they, they had kind of future scenarios for them to consider. They, they kind of created four scenarios, one a kind of techno-optimist scenario, another kind of community development scenario about what Scotland could look like, and got people thinking about different ways of being in, of, that Scotland could be. And I, it's noticeable that the Scottish recommendations include not degrowth necessarily, but things about how we think about progress. So it raises questions about GMP and saying actually we need to focus on well-being and not on so they've really set an agenda for well-being which is really interesting it was a climate assembly and yet you know so they weren't they, usually oh, what well, it's going to be transport policy it's going to be energy policy it's going to be agriculture but actually they were saying there are ways that we think about success in this country that are problematic so they had started doing that work so I think I think some of it's about the, the way the task is set um, some of it is about um, you know, thinking about creating ways for people to think about systems change or to think about futures. And I think, as I say, it's great that you've got Ariella in your group because she's, she's, this is right up her street at the moment. But, you know, think, getting, creating that space, making sure that the, the task leaves it open enough for people to go in those ways uh, and still being a useful topic and, um, and creating those resources for people to think imaginatively. I think you can get most of the way. Now, I, I think we should have this conversation in two or three years time when we've had the next wave of climate assemblies, when we've had the next wave of um, assemblies in this area to get a sense as to whether that was possible. And I think there are really interesting questions about whether a group of randomly selected citizens is th the right institution to do systems change thinking. I don't know. That's 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 the that's the question for the next two to three years. That's very interesting. But uh, can you elaborate about how uh, it was uh, um, how the public 
perceived what, ha what was happening in the Scottish Assembly. Uh, the Scottish I mean, Assembly, much yeah. easier, it's, it's much easier to communicate to the public policies that uh, about uh, cutting uh, CO2 than about uh, changing uh, the way we, we define progress. Yeah, so so it's difficult to say because they've only just the report was only just um, tabled in Parliament. So it's only so the, Scot the Scottish Climate Assembly had two challenges. One was it was taking place during COVID, so it didn't get much publicity because everyone was worried about the COVID crisis, about the pandemic, um, and so it didn't get the kind of media attention. Now it's tabled its its. Um, report just at the start of the of the just they've just had elections. The SNP, which is the lead gov, um, the lead party, has just agreed to a coalition with the Green Party. The Green Party is very and the SNP are very keen on citizens assemblies. So all I can say is watch this space because if it doesn't if if this doesn't catch in in scotland it's not going to catch at all and scotland was already moving towards a well-being economy anyway there's some really interesting ideas in the um in the in the scottish one like they came out this came out through some of the scenarios there's an idea of what they're calling 15 minute communities which means that you should be able to access all the services you need within 15 minutes of your house by foot or by bike you know not by car not by you know, and now that is something that, again that the, that the what's really interesting about that idea is that within it you've got this real that is actually radically systems changing if that was to happen but it's called 15 minute community that doesn't sound much Do you know what I mean? so, so it's really interesting about some of the ideas like well-being like future generations like like these kind of 15 minute communities i think do resonate and so it's about what we've got in Scotland is a kind of political context within which political parties are ready to hear some of these things. In the UK, that wasn't the case. I don't think it was the case in France. So um, I, I think, you know, let's, let's have a conversation in a year or two's time and let's see how that. But yeah, I think it's what you're touching on is exactly the questions we need to be asking. Uh, just for one final point is. I think, to, and this isn't the group that does this, I think people are critical of citizens assemblies too quickly. Um, because they don't have an alternative. They don't have, show me, show me another space where citizens are doing this work. And so I think we should really put some effort into making these things work as well as they can before we give up on them. <laughs> do, do, do you know what I mean? I totally agree. <laughs> Graham, I think we're, we've come down to the end of time. And, and when I, um, when I, when we, we sat in the, and, 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 and dreamed about um, this, this webinar with you, this is exactly what we wanted to happen. So dreams it's, do come it's, true. It's, it's been a real pleasure. It's been real fun. It has right? been. It has been. It's been fascinating. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for your wonderful questions and, and, and conversations. I think we, you've given us a lot to think about in a wide array of senses which we can use, you know, we can apply theory in the best of senses of applied uh, knowledge that um, we're going to need. And um, it's been great. I welcome you back again whenever oh, you can. Let, let's, I mean, for, for me, this is, yeah, for me, this is the start of a conversation. And if you're, if you're certainly, if, certainly if you're developing these processes and you want to run ideas past people like myself, you know, one of, one of the nice things in, about this community is that people are, will give up their time to kind of like come and chat to about when, when people are developing initiatives. So, you know, keep, keep, me, in, keep me in your address book. Thank you, Graham. <laughs> Thanks so much. Okay, and I wish, you, I wish you well. I wish you well. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Thank you.